Hey everybody, I'm Mark Fetter, co-founder of Everyday. I just had a really good conversation with Evelyn Jerome Alexander from Magellan College Counseling, and we talked about all things AP. So first and foremost, what are APs and why do they matter? Um, I think one of the biggest insights I gathered from this conversation is why not to submit an AP exam score on your college application. Really insightful, definitely stick around for that. And then we also just talk about why school rankings aren't everything and, and how families can try to not fall into this rat race of chasing rankings and instead focus more on school fit. Hope you enjoy the interview. Yeah. So today I want to talk about APs. You know, there's a lot of talk about them online. There's a lot of stress that revolves around taking AP classes. So just to get started with, help us understand, you know, first of all, what are APs and why do they matter? Yep. So let me just start by saying, uh, if you hear a funny noise in the background, that's Chloe. She's right here and she sits by my desk and snores. What is Chloe? Who Chloe is, is a little pit bull. Oh. Um, she's, we call her a teacup pit bull. She's like a 45 pound, you know, little Staffordshire Terrier and really not kidding. She's right. Right there. <laughs> you hear that? Um, okay. So let me also start by saying most of the time when I talk to people about APs, I, I do it through the lens of people who are looking to apply to highly, highly selective colleges. So sometimes I start talking about APs and it sounds like I'm telling everyone to take every AP that ever existed and you have to get a five. And, um, and you don't, so let's just start with that. Um, but um, I, I just want to say that there, there's a whole spectrum of answers and a whole spectrum of discussion, and I don't want people whose kids um, shouldn't be or aren't ready to be taking college-level courses or sort of college-level courses to feel like they have to take college-level courses or AP courses or their future is, you know, dashed and you know, that's the end of the story. We're going to community college. So hopefully let's start with that. Um, but in general, the advanced placement program is operated by the college board because, you know, everything is operated by the college board. Um, and of course you have to pay for things that are operated by the college board. So there's that. Um, but the college board has this program of, uh, you know, 26 ish, uh, might, might be a couple more, um, courses that, where the curriculum is standardized um, through the college board, teachers who teach AP courses across the country, um, across the United States are trained to teach at this level and to teach this content. Um, and at the end of the school year, so in May, um, the students who, who took those courses um, take an exam, which is kind of like a big final exam. There's usually, usually um, 2020 has been a crazy year, um, there's usually on most of them, there's a um, multiple choice portion and a writing portion on all of the exams. Um, so that's the, that's kind of the AP program as an overview and many, many colleges um, give college credit for students, um, not just who took the AP courses, but who succeeded in passing the exams and the exams are scored on a scale of one to five. I wasn't kidding. It sounds like there's a bulldozer in my office, right? Um, <laughs> short, short snouted dogs. I've got a French bulldog. She, she sits next to me on a lot of our internal meetings and she snores and sometimes my clients are like, where are you? What, what's happening in there? Um, uh, like sometimes I have to talk louder. So she, um, so anyway, the, uh, uh, exams are scored on a scale of one to five, three is considered passing four is very successful. Five is, is very, very top level. Um, I spend a lot of time, because I'm sort of a data nerd, um, looking at the score distributions, um, and, and each of the exams sort of has a different distribution of the scores. So I'll just give you an example. Um, the AP Physics, there are actually three different AP Physics exams. Um, don't laugh. They're called AP Physics 1, AP Physics 2, and AP Physics C. I don't know why that makes me laugh. Um, um, but the students who take AP Physics C, which is um, uh, like a pretty high level, like magnetism and electron, you know, type physics, the students who get to the point of taking that class and that exam, like 37% of them, I'm, I'm, uh, the number's off the top of my head, so it's not exactly that, but it's a pretty high percentage actually get a five, 
right? The students who take AP Calculus BC, which is kind of like Calculus 2, um, a, a pretty high percentage of them, I don't know the number off the top of my head, get a five. And that's because think about the kind of students who really, you know, take these high, high level courses. You're not going to go all the way through that course if you don't really have that subject down sure. versus um, a, a, a class like an AP um, environmental science or AP US history, the scores are distributed a little bit more evenly between one and five. Gotcha. So you mentioned a minute ago that when you're working with clients that are targeting elite institutions, yep. John Tompkins behind me, maybe one of them, <laughs> um, that you, you definitely advise for them to be going for, you know, I, 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 I hesitate to say maximizing the number of them because I don't, you know, I think we'll, we'll come back to that in a minute. Yeah. But the, the question is, so yeah, how do you identify like an AP course strategy or plan yep. in terms of how many to take and which ones to take or some yep. more important than others? Yep, it's a really, really good question. And honestly, this is why I love talking to families when their students are in ninth grade, because then we can literally plan the next three years. If we don't get to talk until you're done with 11th grade, you know, all of that is in the books already and we really mm -hmm. can't fix any of that. Um, so what I tell families is, um, if you have the opportunity to take some honors classes in ninth grade, there's a big difference, by the way, between eighth grade and ninth grade, right? It's a huge transition between middle school and high school. Um, and so a lot of families, um, you know, I talk to them when their kids are in eighth grade and they say, oh, he's in honors, everything, he's doing great, he's getting straight A's, and then they get to ninth grade and the kids like slam, right? Oh my God, that was way harder than I expected. And, and that um, wake up call is a really good reality check, right? High school is hard. And, and here's really the bottom line of all of this. Colleges, elite colleges. So here's again, where I'm really specifically speaking to those people looking for those elite colleges. Um, elite colleges, highly selective colleges are looking for students who have succeeded in high school and who have challenged themselves. And I'm not gonna say challenge themselves to the maximum um, that was available. Um, but it is important to know that they are looking for students who can complete, who, who have proven that they can complete college level work. I would say this, I think this is a really important point. Colleges know how many um, honors and AP classes are available in your high school. So when your high school sends your transcript, there's a document that travels with your transcript called the school profile. It's a very important document. Usually you can actually find it on your high school website. Um, most people don't know it's there, so you have to go looking for it. But honestly, if you Google the name of your high school and school profile, you will probably find it. When I go looking for it, it's usually either under like the about tab or it's in the college counseling office. It's usually in that navigation bar and colleges look for that because what they're looking for is context. So, you know, and, and Mark asked, you asked um, how many AP classes students should take. And this is where, this is a very difficult question because um, we're not here to ramp up the stress. And I feel like you were alluding to that a little bit. Um, what I usually tell families is, you need to sort of look at what your options are and uh, you know, think about how much rigor your student can really take and be successful. And when I say successful, I don't mean straight A's. It is okay to get a B in an AP class. Um, but if you get, you know, if you had straight A's in ninth grade and then suddenly everything in 10th grade looks like a B and then, you know, in 11th grade, everything looks like a B, that's kind of a downward trend and that's not a good thing. We're kind of looking for high performance, either level or even upward trend. Um, so that, to me, that means don't necessarily take every AP class offered, take a look at what's offered and choose the ones that are honestly the most interesting to you and that might sort of um, match the direction that you're planning on going when you go to college. So for example, I was a political science major at Johns Hopkins, by the way. Yes, it's true, it's possible. Um, um, I took AP political science, which today is called AP government and politics, I think. Um, I, I took AP US history. Um, I didn't have to take AP physics. P.S. I never took physics. I got into Johns Hopkins. I never took physics. Um, uh, I did take AP chemistry, but I, I was sort of a mathy kid. So math and science were, were not 
complicated for me or, or hard for me, but I have so many students who they want to, you know, study psychology or history or humanities and AP calculus is like not in their wheelhouse. And that's fine. If you don't, if you're not a calculus kid and you're going to head to a, you know, history major, then don't, don't stress yourself out with AP calculus. It, it's not worth um, the, the, headache and the heartache that it's going to cause, you know, your child going through that very difficult course when they don't really love it. Yeah, that's such a, <clears throat> such a good point to just basically follow your interests. Yep. Right? If you scour Reddit, you see tons of threads of students asking, hey, like how many class, it's all about how many should I be taking and yep. which one matters more than others. And I feel like every time the short answer should just be like, you're overthinking it. Yep right? Just follow your interests. Yep, if you fine. find a class interesting and you think that's a direction you might want to go, then obviously take that AP class. Take that challenge, as you yep. said. Yep. But otherwise, you're overthinking it. Is that a fair assumption? It's a totally fair assumption. And I have one other thing that people overthink in a huge way that negatively affects their children. Um, there are zero colleges, zero, that require AP exam scores for admission zero. So guess what? They care so much more about the grade you got in the class than the test score. Um, so they'd rather see you succeed all throughout the year and get an A or a B than get a four or five on the exam. Um, and, and so here's where that comes into play. If you take um, uh, the SAT or the ACT or SAT subject tests, which we think and hope are dying, um, at least the subject tests, um, uh, you can pick apart which scores you send to, to colleges, right? You can send only this date. You can send only this um, subject test score. With AP scores, you can't. They travel as a bundle. You can't separate them. So you have to send the whole batch. So what happens if in uh, ninth grade or eighth, uh, tenth grade, you took AP Human Geo and you got a three on the exam. And then in 11th grade, you took A-Push and AP Lang and AP Psych and you got a four, a five, and a two on one of those exams. So now your box has one, two, one, three, one, four, one, five. Those are your scores. We're not going to send those to colleges because they don't make you look like a rock star. That two does not make you look like a rock star. Even the three, it's passing. It doesn't make you look like a rock star. Now, this is where people argue with me. You will get college credit for that three, that four, that five. You will get credit. The admission office doesn't need to see those scores. The registrar needs to see those scores after you enroll. That's when you send those scores. And then you don't have to worry about that, those low scores making you look bad. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And that's a great insight, right? I think oh, I'm glad you brought up this distinction between the importance of taking on the challenge of the class yep. and separating that from the exam, Yep. right? Of course you want to get the three, four or five to, to earn the college credit because then that saves you money and yep. your time. Yep. But I think a lot of people, again, overthink it, but also define success by the exam score. So that's a great point you brought up and on the note of how you define success, right? I think a big mission of ours at Every Day is helping families sort of redefine, rethink what is, what does success look like? How do I raise a successful teenager? Yep. Not treating students like statistics. Um, there's so much more to the individual. So I'm curious, you know, what is your stance? What would you say to someone who is, is just asking you, hey, how do I raise a successful teenager? Well. I mean, I don't want to parse this too much, but when they're asking you, how do I raise a successful teenager? I feel like what they're really asking is, how do I consider myself a successful parent? I mean, this is honestly, I always joke that we are, you know, unlicensed psychologists. You know, this whole process is really um, getting people to the, to the point where they validate their child and themselves, their own parenting, which is really, really difficult. And, and on, on my side, you know, I don't, I, I, this is what we say, you know, to our, to our families. Um, we have to move past the point where we believe that a good test score is the only measure of success and getting into a good college or a top ranked college is 
you know, the best measure of success. There are, um, you know, this is the gospel that I preach. There's 2,200 four-year colleges out there. There is a four-year college for every student who wants to and is ready to attend one. And again, if, if you start thinking early, ninth, 10th grade about this whole college thing, you know, I feel like my job is to help people go beyond the names that they know, right? So people call me all the time and say, is such and such a good school? You know, if you know it, it's probably a good school. The question is not, is it a good school? The question is, is it good for you? Is it the learning environment you want? Is it the social environment, the academic, the emotional environment that you want and in which you will succeed? That's my job is to help students get from point A to point B. And sometimes point B is a school you've never heard of. But um, when I, when we get to that argument, I actually did a presentation for parents last night and one of the parents said, how do I get my child to look beyond the ranking and the reputation? So what I always use is Harvard Law School publishes a list every year of the undergraduate universities and colleges from which their first year law students graduated. And when you pull up that list, um, there's like 300 students in the class and there's about 180 colleges on that list. Um, so they have nice diversity and there are colleges on that list where either you know them and you say, oh my God, you can go to Boise State University and then go to Harvard Law School. You can, you can, you have to succeed at Boise State University. Um, but there's also a whole bunch of colleges on that list that even I've never heard of some of them. And when I show that list to parents, they're like, I've never heard of Excelsior College. I've never heard of Denison University. But you know what? It doesn't matter that you haven't heard of it. What matters is that Harvard Law School has, right? Mm -hmm. Same thing I was looking at, um, uh, I was looking with a student at the biology department at University of Denver, um, which is not highly ranked and it is not hard to get into. Um, but we were looking at the faculty and one of the faculty members had her um, undergraduate from Western Washington University, which I happen to love Western Washington University, um, but she had her PhD from Cornell and um, which is Ivy. So, you know, Again, most parents that I work with, you know, if you think you're headed for a highly, highly selective college, you are going to look at Western Washington and go, oh, it's a safety. I don't want to go there. But the question is, what do you do when you get there? What um, impact do you have on the campus, on your, on your classmates, on your professors? Because that is what will determine your next step. And your next step after a school that you may not have heard of before you started your admission process, your next step could be that highly ranked school that you desperately want so badly. All of that to say, um, I still don't want parents to, you know, judge and criticize their own parenting by the result that their children get. To me, if, you're, if, if the student ends up in a place where he or she is happy and successful, you have been a successful parent. Right, yeah, it's a, it's a tough, sort of mental shift to make. Because I've taught, you know, a lot of our, our clients, I talk to the parents on a daily basis and, you know, they admit that in the social circles, yep. this is the conversation of, hey, yep. where did your child get into? Yep. And it's, it, it's their own sort of ranking game. And so I don't know, I don't know what the answer is. I don't know if you have any thoughts on how do you change that, that mental attitude of let's just not even have that conversation. It's, it's, it's how's your child's mental health, wealth and health, oh, health and wellness. <laughs> right. I mean, is it possible that the conversation will shift to that? I mean, I, I feel like the ideal answer to that question is my child is really, really happy at Lewis and Clark. Yep. My child is really, really thriving at Southwestern University. So I know that's not easy to identify the right school for you, especially if you haven't heard of it right so how do you help your clients identify school fit or at least think about it so I love that within my reach I have this fabulous book which I know <laughs> you know all about called colleges that change lives um, and I literally have it right here I don't normally have it right here but I gave this webinar last night um, and and that parent who said how do I get my child to go beyond the rankings you know you have to go beyond the names that you know if you and if you have a college list of only top 25, only top 50 schools, your child will end up with more rejection letters than acceptance letters. Um, I have a student who was admitted to four Ivies last year. He still had more rejections than acceptance letters, right? And so what, what I like to do with parents is say, I really want you to think in your mind about 
your resilience when you were 17 years old and the resilience of your 17 year old and how many of those rejection letters do you really think they want to read and it's not a it's not a statement about i'm not telling you that your child won't get into a highly selective school he might she might um but on the way to that there's a lot of negative feedback um, there just is, because when you're talking about a school that admits 5, 6, 8, 12, 17%, you know, UCLA gets 100,000 plus applications, their acceptance rate's like 15%, right? So, you know, the chances of getting into a UCLA or even a USC, people my age can't even fathom that USC's acceptance rate's like 13% now. Mm -hmm. um, it's not good, as you were saying, it's not good for the psyche of a 17 year old. So, you know, t when, when people like me preach balance, you know, when I say we, we want you to have a balanced list, it's because I don't want you to get those rejection letters. And, you know, you're the parent, I'm not standing there when they open the rejection letter, but you are. Um, and, and a lot of them come on the same day and you don't want to be standing next to them when they get three in a row. That's going to be a very, very bad day in your house. Yeah. So, so how, you know, tell us a little bit more about, you know, your services and, and, you know, what you do with Magellan. Um, maybe perhaps if anyone has not heard of a certified educational planner, what does that mean? Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so a certified educational planner is uh, an organization. So the bad news is there's no licensure for calling oneself a college counselor. You could literally, my, my snoring dog can hang out a shingle tomorrow and say, well, she probably knows a lot, but um, and say she's a college counselor. And, um, and so people sort of don't know what questions to ask when they're you know, looking for a college counselor. So here's what I tell them. Um, yes, I'm a certified educational planner. There's literally like less than 40 of us in California. Um, it means that I um, have visited a large, large number. I've visited over 400 colleges. I've literally stopped counting. Um, I, uh, I prepared for probably six months to take a pretty significant exam. It was like five and a half hours. Um, and, and every five years I have to recertify. So I have to visit a certain number of colleges. I have to do um, a certain amount of professional development. Um, uh, uh, everyone on my team has a certificate in college counseling, which again, not required, um, but for me, it's required to be a part of the Magellan team. Um, what we do is we help students, like I just said, you know, get to that balanced list, um, get to the point where, you know, uh, everyone knows what a safety school is, right? It has sort of a negative connotation. We like our students to like their safeties. Um, we call them likelies. Um, and, uh, and, and it's really about um, a little bit of a mind shift and helping them see that, you know, that one college that you've been fixated on since you were eight is not the only place that you would be happy and successful. So we spend a lot of time researching colleges, you know, helping them go beyond the names that they know, come up with that balanced list. Most of the time it means they get more acceptances than rejections and have a lot of choices, which, you know, when it comes down to it, you're, you're choosing where you're going to spend four years and really where you're going to launch your adult life. Like when I think about my friends, all of my friends, many of my friends, my best friends are from college. They're from my dorm freshman year. They're my sorority sisters. Um, my business contacts are people that I went to college with. So it's a really important decision. Um, and it's not to say that you can't or shouldn't go to that school that you've had your mind on for all these years. But, um, you know, for example, both of my parents went to UCLA. UCLA would have been torture for me. It just was not the right environment. Um, so, and this is a big problem too. Parents kind of have in their head, like, well, I went to UC Santa Barbara, so my kids should go to UC Santa Barbara. It's a great place. I had a great time. But the question is really take a step back and let's think about what the right experience for your child is. And I'm not saying let your child drive the bus completely, but they do have to have a say in the process. So part of what we do is we kind of stand between the parent and the student and, and help the student take a little bit more ownership of the process. Nice. Yeah, I think that's so important. Um, I believe a lot of people who do hire consultants initially go into the process thinking I'm here to give my child a leg up on getting into insert, you know, most likely Ivy League or some sort of yep. Um, elite school. Yep, yep. But really, I think the true value is everything we've just talked about, which is identifying the right school that's the right match and fit for that student, yep. not just in terms of prestige or career opportunity. 
but the experiential learning yep. and the you know lifelong outcomes that'll that'll come from that. Absolutely. And you know, sometimes we get a little pushback and people say, well, but the alumni association is so much stronger here, you know, but the name recognition is so much stronger here. And here's the here's the truth. The the job that you get out of college is very, very closely tied, <clears throat> excuse me, to the internship that you had while you were in college. So my honestly, my number one tip is when you're researching colleges, go to the career center. Um, if, if you're still visiting virtually, look at the Career Center. Find out where students get internships. Find out who's recruiting on that campus. Um, it doesn't matter if you go to Princeton or if you go to, um, you know, Grinnell College in the middle of Iowa. Um, it's all about that job or that internship you have while you're in college. And the job that you have after your first job um, is very, very strongly related to what your first job was and, and very much not related to the college that you went to. In fact, um, I've seen and heard that many, many companies and government entities are actually blocking out the name of the college that the student attended because we're getting to this point where we're trying to be um, as equitable as possible and tr look at people's actual skills and what they bring to the workplace and not be biased by the name of the university that they attended. Good, I'm glad. Hopefully it, it works. Hopefully. Yeah, great. Was there anything else you'd like to discuss? That was fantastic. I feel like we could talk for hours. I know, I feel like I'm just shouting stuff at you, so I'll stop. <laughs> Well, for those of you who are watching, hopefully you found some good uh, insight from this conversation. I'll be providing notes uh, below the video if you want to learn more about uh, Magellan and their services and Evelyn and her services. Uh, and please subscribe below for, for access and updates on more interviews coming up. Thanks. Thank, Thank you, you, Evelyn. Thank you.